Okay, years ago, in 1989, I think it was, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a man called John Wyver, made a program to begin the new channel La Set. Uh, he made a program called L'Objet d'Art, Dans l'Age Electronique. Um, and it was a reference to Walter Benjamin's 1935 essay, The Objects of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In that program, I think John was trying to take on the incoming issues that were not uh, overt at that point, but the incoming issues that digitality would produce. And there's the phone. Hello? Yes, speaking. I think it was about 1989 when a friend of mine, a man called John Wyver, was commissioned to make a program that uh, was to begin a new television channel called La Set. And he decided to make a program that was based upon or referenced the 1935 essay by Walter Benjamin entitled. Uh, the Object of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Um, his programme was called L'Objet d'Art dans l'Age Electronique, or The Objects of Art in the Age of Electronic Reproduction, which uh, tested the idea of um, the object of art, or any, ob any art object, having an aura that makes it itself be a piece of art. In other words, were reproductions of that piece still art? Did they in any way maintain the aura of that piece? And um, one of the propositions of the programme was that, uh, and this was mooted by Baudrillard, uh, that the ubiquity of the image, the fact that the image has been so reproduced in our society. This preceded the notion of digitality, by the way. But the, the image has become so ubiquitous that the sense of meaning uh, was missing from the image. And consequently, there's an argument that the aura had also departed from the object of art, the art object. Ripping and tearing. Now, um, I saw this program and uh, I listened to the ideas in this program and I found myself, um, as usual, becoming... Uh, I was quite angry in those days <laughs> Pshht. about everything, really. Uh, I still get angry, but not quite... not, uh, not, so, uh, not so often. Um... The notion that meaning lay within the image uh, perturbed me because I was fairly convinced that uh, meaning lie within the individual and we, it's us, that attributes meaning. In fact, it's the interplay between the 
object or the image and our own gaze that produces meaning and significance. So I decided to set upon making a piece of art, uh, an answer to Baudrillard, an answer to John Wyver's programme, um, that took on some of the ideas that I'd been investigating. And one of those ideas was the notion that there should be uh, an image track that had no particular set of meanings to it other than its repetition at certain points, uh, certain uh, coincidences with uh, meanings within the soundtrack. And also what was going on in my mind was that, uh, that echo was sound and Narcissus was image. It, it interested me, the notion in the Greek myth that uh, when uh, the tragedy of Echo and Narcissus, the tragedy of Narcissus's uh, uh, punishment to be fascinated by his own image in in the pond on I believe it was Mount Helicon now. I mean we're talking it's this is this is like this is some thirty years ago I think when I was thinking about this stuff. <phone rings> Nearly thirty years. Um and the proposition was that, in some way, his fascination with his own image and every word that he spoke to his own image was answered by Narcissus as she was, uh, sorry, as Echo, as she was uh, listening to him and she was in love with him and that was her punishment. But equally, her punishment was also that she could only answer with the sound that the person that she was trying to talk to was making. So in other words, she could only echo what he said to himself, which invested what he said to himself with more meaning and gave a feedback loop to Narcissus as he was concentrating on the pool and bound him even deeper, which bound her even deeper. So image and sound were bound together, completely bound together in a tragic uh, consequence. She was desolate and he was desolate. So, I began The Inevitability of Colour, where colour was uh, a metaphor for meaning, uh, in which I wanted to deal with the Baudrillard and say, actually, no, old chap, the issue is that um, it's us that look, and it's the image that looks back, and between us we bind significance and meaning. Now, I may well have got Mr Baudrillard wrong, but... Um, point is it inspired a piece of work from me and uh, I was then moved to go on and make another piece of work called uh, Echo's Revenge where uh, sound and image interrogate each other and uh, that became part two of the colour trilogy so I made a three-part series which was made with part three which was the object of desire which is that thing that Narcissus sees in the pool as he gazes into it Uh, and it wasn't long before I realised that my three-part series, the Colour Trilogy, should in fact be a seven-part series called The Colour Myths, where Inevitability of Colour is part one, and Echo's Revenge is part two, but The Object of Desire should be part six. And there were many other pieces that I wanted to make. And in fact, the first piece I believe I made in 1990, 1989-1990, and I'd finished the object of desire by 82, but um, only in 2005 did I make uh, The Eye Projects the World, although I'd written the script in 1991, and I'd also wrote the script for Timepiece in 1991 too, but I threw those scripts away and kind of remade it. made both of them but uh, what you will see are the seven parts and these parts will be this is March 2007 you will have seen me in uh, 1977 uh, I thought it was important to uh, this is a long piece of work over time this is a piece of work in time 
So uh, I thought it important to play with my own image as I am now, because I'm not really here, of course. I'm just on a screen, aren't I? Is this a candle? Is this an image? Is this a sound? Let there be light. Ceci n'est pas une. Do you feel its warmth? Does it light your path? No. Have you seen this image too often? Has it lost its meaning for you? Is this a candle? Is this an image? Is this a sound? I am Lucifer, bringer of light. Prometheus, stealer of fire. I am the knower, the known, and the knowing. The mask of God. Lucifer falling into Adam forgetting. I am that which seeks my opposite. I am all things to all men. I am that I am. And I, all these things to all women and more. I am Pandora, bringer of knowledge. I am the oracle, the weaver of fate. I am all that there is that ever was that ever will be. I am that which answers that which seeks. Wanting to see meaning in all things, people saw God, and those, not wanting to be seduced by the world, put out their eyes and stopped light coming into their souls. But they still heard, so they destroyed their hearing. Still they felt. So they tore off their skins, put out their tongues, cut off their noses. But still they thought with their minds. And Prometheus wept. In the state of bondage, there is only the seduction of the spirit. Each knows when and how it occurs. The only wrong done is to the self. Without beginning and without end. Pandora knew that in the world, each self-image is a collision with reality, a jarring of the soul. Each sound creates a wound. Each image a shard of light cut in the blackness. Lucifer falling into shards of light, the great sacrifice of all eternity, the selfless act. Each refracting, reflecting, light-giving fragment, a self-conscious existence in all this great darkness of the womb of God. And in all of this, there are only two things to do. The necessary and the impossible. And these two are inevitable. When I look, I see, and when I see, I become filled. For when I look, I in fact see, and when I see and see, I am finding. When I listen, I hear, and when I hear, I become filled. For when I listen, I am hoping, 
And if I hear, hope is fulfilled. These two senses, unlike the other senses, require effort. And effort to look, to listen, by its nature, is a kind of striving. Now the world is filled with images, both of serendipity and our construction. The images we construct are powerful images, all pervading images, unrelenting images, merciless images. Voices of the dispossessed, the quiet voices, are not heard above the clamor for attention, the hubbub, the clamor of baser forces, baser instincts unleashed in our modern world. But the quiet voices are resilient. They linger on and hide themselves in the sound of the wind, the breaking of the waves, the rumble of the earth sleeping. Listen. Listen. When I was 14, uh, I was sitting in a, a history lesson and I'd come across the idea of infinity, or at least at that moment, the idea of infinity had engaged me. And I was thinking hard on, well, how to, how to realize it in my mind. In other words, how can my mind, how could my mind encompass the idea of infinity? When in fact, the whole idea of infinity was, it was that little bit more than you could imagine. It was always one more than you could number. And so I had been sitting there. It was a double period. It had gone on for, I don't know, 50 minutes or something. And I was puzzling away. I was trying to envision it. I was trying to picture it as, a, as an image. I was trying to see it as numbers. I was just trying to encompass it in some way. When suddenly... My mind shifted up a gear and all of the usual intellectual functions fell away and I'll, I would say that I saw an image but rather I experienced an experience and the experience was of, the, the class didn't exist anymore, the all and everything that had ever been that was and ever would be came into my, I'd say my mind, but I experienced this sense of this thing all at one moment. There it all was. All of time, all of matter, all of space was there. And then it was not there. Nothing was there. There was nothingness. And then it was all there again, everything, the immensity of it all. And then there was nothingness. And I must have passed out because I came to, I came to in a corridor outside the class and I was a bit uh, destabilized. And I noticed that you could see through windows in the corridor that the class was going on. And eventually, after a few moments, because we must have been near the end of the thing, the, uh, the class ended and people started streaming out. And I, I said to some people that came out, what happened? What, why am I outside? And one of them said to me, you began shouting, I know, I know, I know. And the teacher had basically ejected me from the class and throw me out. Listen. Listen. In the most elegantly formulated equation, Einstein offered the definition of energy. For are not all things transformable into energy? As mass multiplied by the speed of light, E equals mc squared. He said, absolute mass is the still state of all energy. 
and the movement of matter at the speed of light therefore transforms matter into energy. Light does not just have a velocity in one direction, it expands spherically in all directions. E is empty squared, fragments. It is instant, without duration, timeless. The nonsense legend, the Big Bang, finds one end of the universe closed and the other end open to infinity. A person an instant before death weighs the same as a person during the moment of death and a moment after death. Something weightless has departed. Something non-physical. Something that is energetic. Lucifer. With a newborn, something weightless has come into being, into the process of becoming aware of itself. When it dies, it simply frees itself from the process and necessity of self-awareness. What we can't reasonably speculate about is the state of energy before and after the process of being. But we do know that E equals MC squared. Here is a great mystery. Sacrifice. sleep if you do not wish to dream. Stay awake, stay awake, artist. Do not give in to sleep, lest you become eternity's hostage and the prisoner of time. Something that is only a personal expression within another's framework cannot be termed a creation. Creation is not the arrangement of objects and forms. It is the invention of new laws. Like electron microscopes looking into eternity, we see only electrons. And what are electrons, if not reality itself? These are the tools we use to see the world. The way we see the world produces the ways in which we make sense of the world, which in turn produces the designs of the tools with which we see. This is a way of looking at the world. As artists, our position is that of competence between two worlds. One that we don't acknowledge. The other that does not yet exist. One of the first thoughts was that the key was sexual. Then we thought the key was power. Now we know that these are only parts of the puzzle. Now we know that there are many potential, shall we say, archetypes waiting to come into play. We believed in the mind. We had faith in its separateness. We located our ideas in the history of ideas and found corresponding ideas in the past. We no longer dismiss the synthesis of ideas of the mythic world, the world of stories, the world of analogy, of totems, of symbols. When I was 18, uh, I met someone who took me around the country uh, and it took a month and we hitchhiked and the country being England and uh, we had no money. Uh, the principle of the hitchhiking was to see if we could survive on faith alone. In other words, tune in somehow to some other reality that would enable us to be uh, not harmed fed, clothed, uh, that we'd get shelter, and so on. And that passed off fine. And uh, after a while back in the capital, which is where I lived, um, I, I was taught to uh, meditate, simple kind of Buddhist meditation. And uh, so I had this kind of mystical bent, which I was pursuing. and. Um, one night, I woke up into a state of complete bliss and I had no body, I had barely a sense of self and I was existent, terrible metaphor this, but like a boat on the waves of bliss, I was just 
experiencing this extraordinary wonder and the wonderfulness of it all. And occasionally there was only the waves of bliss. There was no self, it seemed to me, me. Eventually, in this experience, which has stayed with me all of my life, it's the, it's the one memory that uh, is more important than any other memory. Eventually, I must have fallen asleep, the eye of me, whatever was carrying the experience. And suddenly, there was a tremendous barking at my ear, like a dog barking, snarling, a, a quarter of an inch away from my ear and I was propelled at a massive speed from the state of bliss into a state of fear and terror for a moment and then I regained my body and sense of self and all the rest of it. Eventually the fear passed away and I fell asleep I talked to my friend who was introducing me to things and she was uh, amazed at the experience but her grasp of what I'd gone through was that she'd said that uh, in many many cultures the dog is the being that sits outside the, as guardian to the underworld and uh, it's like Cerebrus really had just bitten at me and there was a kind of danger I suppose that uh, this experience had come to me way before I was ready for it because it's passed away as a, as a memory now and I can speak it but and I, can re I can remember how wonderful it was but it's now gone. Narcissus was a beautiful but self-centered individual, and he drew many people to him and spurned them easily when he wanted them no more. A youth whom Narcissus had spurned prayed to Nemesis, goddess of justice, who arranged that Narcissus should stop to drink on the heights of Mount Helicon. The youth he had rejected was more affected than most. Fatefully, our youth was, so to speak, brother to Narcissus. So to be spurned affected him as it would Narcissus himself, were he to be spurned. On Mount Helicon, Narcissus became thirsty. He scooped some water from a pool and drank. Nemesis smiled her grim smile. Glancing into the water, Narcissus fell in love with his own image and lay down beside the pool. He had become Fascinated. I've often wondered about what is real and what is not. It seems to me that what I can touch is real. At the same time, I know that what I believe in can give me pleasure or it can give me pain. This I know. But I'm fascinated by the possibility of an interior life. I close my eyes and see colours and shapes shifting at their own pace through the screen of my mind. If I wait long enough, I begin to approach the boundaries of sleep. I've always wanted to cross that boundary consciously. I know that when I dream, I'm involved in a different set of relationships with the world than those I normally had. My attitude changes. Somehow, all things become possible. Zeus persuaded Echo to chatter to Hera so that he could dally with the other nymphs. Echo was more than glad to help the king of all the gods whenever she could. Of course, Zeus had not told her the whole, the complete truth. He had simply allowed Echo's naivety in matters of this kind to innocently occupy Hera's time. Though initially enjoying Echo's vitality, as with all things, Hera eventually became irritated by Echo's constant gossiping. Becoming suspicious, 
Hera, by godlike intuition, realized what was the root of Echo's talking and caused her a strange malady. She could no longer begin a conversation, but only repeat the words of others. What perplexes me is that we came into this world without blame, then we accepted it as an unwelcome gift, and then we have other gifts. I seem to have various faculties that enable me to examine the minute eye of existence, what she feels, what he feels, what I am feeling. Yet, this perceptual, one might almost say, intuitive apparatus only works at the level at which we live, the mundane. But what draws us onward, or me at least, is the very thought that there might be a supramundane, something else other than our own way of seeing. I sometimes feel that someone is speaking to me over my shoulder, trying to warn me. Banished from the home of the gods, Echo wandered upon Mount Helicon. She came upon Narcissus, and like all the others, fell in love with him. The youth seemed fascinated with his gently undulating image in the pool. He didn't acknowledge Echo. She tried to speak to him, saying, It is only your image. Your words are lost. Speak to me, for I can respond. But Hera's art was such that Echo's emotion was placed in her echoing of Narcissus's words to himself, so that it seemed, in fact, that his image was replying. This hurt Narcissus. Here was the person he had always been looking for, taunting him. He couldn't tear himself away from his image. By charms, she could not interrupt him, but only repeat his words to himself, which inflamed and further enslaved him. She was desolate, and he was desolate. Narcissus finally died from unrequited love, and the flower that we now call the Narcissus arose from the spot where he died. As for Echo, she faded away sick with love until only her voice remained to haunt the mountain. Listen. Can you hear her? She has made a great sacrifice. Somewhere in the darkness, in the huge vista that is our mind, she is repeating everything we say back to ourselves. She can only repeat what she hears, but she can play with the sounds. She can speak slowly and quietly. Or she can rage at us. And he, he is ever present. He only hears himself. He speaks and constantly reiterates his position. I am at the center of the universe. I. Talking to the camera is really hard. It's like talking to yourself or even worse than talking to an answer phone but uh, where a friend's not there when you're ringing them. Um, okay. I had one last major experience and this is the hardest one to talk about. Uh, the others were simple uh, vision, simple visions. The others were visions uh, of a young mind, though very mystical. When, when I was 21, um, I had a dream. It was a very powerful dream. I don't dream very much. I don't, uh, I don't have many visual dreams. I always put it down to the fact that um, uh, because my imagination is so engaged in reality, doing this for instance, making work, uh, there's not too much need to process data in the dream state. I suppose I do though. It's just I flatter myself I suppose. But the thing is, um, I was standing outside my mother's house. My mother is uh, bedridden now 
and uh, I suppose I don't know how much longer she's got. I've seen a lot of death in the last few years, so I've, I've had to reflect on this mortal coil quite a lot. Uh, and, a, and a simple thing happened in the dream, and I don't really know what it means. But I kind of I talk I talk about it here because these three experiences somehow must inform this work. Uh, I simply stood before my mother's house, and I spread my arms in a kind of uh, it's the kind of pose you'd see in Christian iconography. In fact. The feeling that I felt when I spread my arms was that of being beatified. And as that feeling came over me, I began to ra raise up. I become, began to lift up into the air. And the further I raised, the further my body raised, the less substantial my body became until there was nothing left. It's an interesting problem we have here. Everything in the world, this group agreement about what is and what is not, denies everything that has meaning to us in life. We are fascinated by the amphitheater of our experience and we do its bidding, this reality, with commitment. What greater commitment have we than the destruction of the globe? What half-hearted commitment do we have for its salvation? I feel, from the presence of my shoulder, that I should have a greater commitment to this interior world. Perhaps then, some truth will be shown to me. It is in the very nature of the senses that we apportion meaning. That straining to hear is, in fact, the ordering of things to project the meaning implicit in ourselves. In listening to the silence, we will hear the crying in the wilderness. It is our own voice returning to us. Our souls say, Ego, listen. It is in the very nature of seeing images that we see the archetypes those parts of ourselves addressing that which does not listen, but only sees itself. Nemesis, being a god, knew that Narcissus was only seeking to complement himself, to find his other half. For are we not all the actual looking for the potential? And Narcissus was moved more strongly than others in his search for perfection. Echo, however, was naive innocent and selfless. She only sought his completion and would have been completed in this. So in a sense, Nemesis was unjust. But the acts of the gods are beyond the understanding of mortals that no doubt are full of justice in their own realm. Narcissus is a beautiful image. Echo a beautiful sound. Each finds meaning from seeking and the pain of desiring self-fulfillment or self-knowledge. For now they are sought by others who only wish to observe or listen to their beauty, not to possess it or themselves to be possessed by it. Bring her of life. Narcissus is image and Echo is sound. The one states its truths, and the other comments on its ideas. We find the two existing, or at least their semblance existing, in the world around us. This is the judgment that Nemesis, goddess of compensation, ruled for eternity. This is the judgment that Zeus and Hera, king and queen of the gods, approved of. the alchemical marriage of Echo and Narcissus, the two that are separate are unified, and in the transformation of old ideas, the birth of the new, there is no force irresistible, no object immovable, so we go forward into the very mechanism of fear, for in that darkness lay the truth of our searching, 
we must accomplish the impossible because it is necessary. And in the darkness, lies. Ceci n'est pas une. Do you feel its warmth? Does it light in your path? No. Have you seen this image too often? Is it losing its meaning for you? For those that watch and listen, for those eyes adjusted to the dim light, everything appears without color. Yet, when the searchlight of our imagination sweeps across the endless vistas, brighter because it has more to illuminate, we receive as a gift the inevitability of color. These gods of the unconscious, of past epochs, are passing. There are greater truths possible as other gods awaken. Using the mind, the sense that colors, we can perceive the nature of light, hear the nuances of meaning, the subtleties of touch, the poetry of taste, the fragrance of smell. We can hear the hearing, see the seeing, taste the tasting, touch the touching. And behind all this, the unifying sense that attributes meaning We see the image of a woman with glycerine tears running down her face. The soundtrack contains her laughter in reverse. We see a big close-up of a 35mm SLR camera. The shutter fires and we hear a sharp burst of sound. Pshht! 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 We see water rippling from the centre of a still pool. We see a painting of Echo and Narcissus. We hear the sound of ripping and tearing. Against black, we hear the sound of a woman laughing. We see the picture of a pipe. We hear the sound of ball bearings falling onto a wooden xylophone. We cut into a blurry, shaking camera, which is wildly panning around a room. Occasionally, the image is frozen. And we hear the sound of the SLR shutter firing at the point of the freeze. Pshht. In black, a voice announces, Ceci n'est pas une. We see a picture of an oak tree. In black, we hear the sound of... Jets screaming past us. We see a big close-up of the lens of the SLR. The shutter fires, but we do not hear it. We see a blurred freeze of two jets passing overhead. There is no sound. In black, we hear the sound of... A glass smashing. We see a child's wooden xylophone on a tabletop. We see a shower of ball bearings falling onto it. When the shower has stopped, we hear the sound of the... Ball bearings falling onto the wooden xylophone. In black, we hear the sound of... A glass smashing. We see a mock-up of Michael Craig Martin's sculpture, The Oak Tree. This consists of a glass of water on a glass shelf. A voice announces... 
This is not a glass of water. Over black, we hear a child's voice. Da, 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 da. We see the image of a Welsh valley. After a moment, two jets scream past the camera. A voice announces... Welsh Valley with jets. We hear the sound of an SLR shutter firing. There is no sound. We see... a blurred freeze... of a glass smashing. There is no sound. The camera tracks into a room in which a one-year-old child is sitting. The camera comes to rest on the floor in front of the child. The camera is tossed and turned and banged, then comes to rest. We see the child crawling out through the doorway. Against black, we hear the sound of... Ripping and tearing. Followed by... The sound of smashing glass. We see a child's wooden xylophone on a tabletop. We see a shower of ball bearings falling onto it. There is no sound. In black, a voice announces... This is not a glass of water. We see a big close-up of the lens of the SLR. The shutter fires and we hear the sharp burst of sound. No. In black, we hear the sound of... Chalk scratching onto a blackboard. We see the image of a woman with glycerin tears running down her face. We hear a voice in black. It says... This is an oak tree. We see a hand writing E equals MC squared onto a blackboard. There is no sound. In black, we hear a child's voice. Da, 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 da. We see and hear a glass smashing on the ground. In black, a voice announces... Welsh Valley with jets. We see a child's wooden xylophone on a tabletop. We see and hear... A shower of ball bearings fall onto it. In black we hear the sound of a woman laughing. Nope. We cut into the middle section of the child playing with a video camera. It is occasionally frozen and is accompanied by the sound of the SLR shutter firing. We hear the sound of two jets passing. We see a hand writing E equals MC squared in chalk on a blackboard. The sound is late by half a second. We hear the sound of an SLR. It's shutter firing. Pshht, pshht, pshht. We see Craig Martin's oak tree, over which we hear the sound of Perry filling a glass. In black, a voice announces... Ceci n'est pas une. We see the SLR firing. We do not hear a sound. In black, we hear the sound of ripping and tearing. We see a photocopy of the painting of Echo and Narcissus coming out of a photocopy machine. It is then torn in half. In black, we hear the sound of a woman laughing over an SLR shutter firing frantically which echoes off into the distance. We see water rippling back into the still centre of a pool of water.
There is a mystery within meaning and understanding that arose in the very beginning. Out of chaos issued the universe. Out of chaos, the cosmos. One of the daughters of chaos, night, spawned nemesis, writer of wrongs, wronger of rights, by virgin birth. Nemesis herself was the personification of the resentment aroused in men by other men who commit crimes with impunity or who experience inordinate good fortune. The gods themselves were not unaffected by resentment and thus Nemesis was the most powerful of gods but without the recognition of gods or men. Nemesis was occasionally worshipped in the ignorance of men as two Nemeses, both of whom, like Nemesis, came of virgin birth to the goddess of night. Men's worldly understanding could not see how the opposites could be united within the same being. But in herself, Nemesis was one and unaffected by the good and the bad. Zeus fell in love with Nemesis, recognizing her power over all that was created, over all that had an opposite. Zeus, himself victim of opposites, fell prey to her dispassionate nature, but she was not interested and so shunned his advances. Zeus asked Aphrodite one of his children by Dione, to help him win Nemesis. Aphrodite, in the form of an eagle, pretended to chase Zeus, who had turned into a swan. He took refuge in the lap of Nemesis. Nemesis, through compassion, entered the world of opposites and became overcome in turn by sleep. In that sleep, Nemesis dreamt of the good and of the bad, and this entered her nature. Zeus, in the form of a swan, raped Nemesis, and sometime later, Nemesis bore an egg. Hermes, messenger, deliverer, then took this egg to Leda, wife of the Spartan king Tyndareus. Leda hatched the egg and reared the chick as her own. The chick was Helen, later of Troy, an incarnation of Echo, as Paris, lover of Helen, was himself an incarnation of Narcissus. And as each lost each other through death, the story continued through the ages as they repeatedly found each other and lost each other through successive incarnations. Echo and Narcissus, sound and image, had finally found one another through the medium of tragedy. And therein lies the mystery at the heart of meaning.
This is an unreal timepiece. It is the image of a clock, not a clock. In fact, this is a television. And television, like clocks, are timepieces. Tick tock, tick tock. This clock can go backwards as well as forwards. Television stays in the same place, but moves us. Television is a mirror in which we are mirrored, and we are mirrors of our world. This is the image of a clock in a mirror on the TV in our minds. It's time to wake up.